Welcome to CFD for Industry. I'm Cade Beck, and I'm your host. In this podcast, we'll pull back the curtain on what it takes to do successful CFD for Industry. We'll talk with industry experts at the leading edge of technology who have diverse business, consulting, and research and development experience. So join me as we learn together about what it takes to do CFD for Industry. Abhishek Chopra is the co-founder and CEO of Boson QSI, the world's first quantum SaaS for multiphysics. In today's episode, you'll learn what made Abhishek change his plans from pursuing his doctorate to going all in on his quantum startup. Awesome. Thanks for joining us on the show today, Abhishek. I'm really excited to to talk with you today. This is one I've been looking forward to. So briefly, I just really want to start right now and kind of a little bit about yourself, what you're doing, what is Boson QSI, and then we can kind of dive in and go from there. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much, Kate, for having me. I'm really excited to to be part of this. And uh, I hope uh, some people can learn something about new areas of quantum uh, quantum computing and quantum fluids through through this conversation. Just to give you a little bit of background, I'm somebody who's genuinely very passionate about uh, CFD. Uh, I actually got to know about CFD right from my high school. I was the first introduction for me is I was trying to understand something on Wikipedia about the surface of sun when it was written and I went for in depth and there was a NASA article it was referring to which was talking about oh you predict all these things using something called as computational fluid dynamics. I didn't understand any of the equations back then but because I didn't understand things it moved me towards I want to understand this. I always like somebody who likes to punch above my weight class as, as they call it. So it was since it was tough it was really exciting for me. So I made this goal that I want to pursue this area I want to understand and I want to be a researcher and want to make some contribution towards it so uh, fast forward i got into rutgers university where i was the, the reason i got there was because of a couple of professors who were pioneers in computational fluid dynamics i got to work bo- with both of them one is professor edward demoro who is my mentor he gave me a lot of my experience in experimental fluid dynamics i did PIV and Schlieren uh, in a supersonic wind tunnel. Uh, got to know about shock waves. I did very exciting research towards my back end of my undergrad in, in Lambda shock waves and those kind of things. I also worked with Professor Doyle Knight, who specialized in high speed flows and CFD of that. He was the reason for me to go to Rutgers, to be honest, at first place. To, to get to him, it was a hard journey. So I did a lot of research before I was enough to, to be part of his research group in some sense. From there, I got my passion during my third or fourth year towards rotary wing aerodynamics. So I was researching on wind turbines, EV tolls, and did a project on EV toll. Uh, big team, 25 team, 25 member team, uh, Ruth and myself. So that's where I met my co-founder, Ruth. During my undergrad, actually, we were the best buddies and had one question. How can we solve Navier Stokes equation? We, we are we are naive enough to think that we can do that and even to this day i like to believe that we can do that like at least before you know this lifetime so that's that's the the thought process much further along caught accepted into a number of grad schools selected rpi rensselaer politic institute in upstate new york because again i got to pursue computational fluid dynamics this time developing computational fluid dynamics for high performance computing for applications on wind turbines and EV tolls, which became a strong interest of mine. And it was there where I discovered what does actually high-performance computing entail? What does those large-scale problems entail? The challenges that we face with parallelization, open MPI, I used MPI, further went into GPUs, and that, that's that's really the in, innate reason why we landed up uh, starting Boson QSI. But I can go on to, you know, talk about, you know, those kind of things and the details during my conversation. But that that's that's really the two instances that happened during my grad school. One was I performing large-scale simulations on national lab supercomputers, massive calculations which ran for six months. And I always thought about, you know, whatever we are doing in academia is exciting, but industry, are they even going to look at it? The answer is no. 
Yeah. Um, and multiple times people told me. The second of instance was the 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 supercomputing cluster at my university got decommissioned and a new supercomputing cluster was put up, which was 95% GPU capability. And all my codes that I was doing on Fortran, C++, legacy Fortran code, all got obsolete because they were MPI-based CPU codes. And that's what is happening across the globe. I believe that every code is changing to GPU-based codes and we were not ready. I did not agree to that situation. This is what led me to applying to different programs. I was invited to different, some of the GPU you know, programs that we know across the globe. I was a particular one that I was invited to was Oak Ridge National Lab and NVIDIA did the program with that, tried to convert this legacy code to GPU-based, successfully was able to complete that. But the very thing happened at the end was the performance improvement was just 4 to 5x, not exciting enough for us to solve massive scale DNS problem, let's say. So that is where it led to, okay, uh, what's next? If we start our own company and if we just do GPU, somebody will beat us in the game. That's where the quantum computing side of my developed enough that I was I gained, gained the and like uh, courage enough to start this as a as a startup I would say and uh, I've been very proud of that decision. Every day is a challenge, but I love what I'm doing to be honest. And the only goal is how can I enable all the fellow CFDers to you know to do DNS of this massive problem, which I think so. There was a 2019 paper uh, on AIAA if I'm not wrong, which said we will not be able to do full aircraft DNS simulation until 2070, given that the current trend in the supercomputing power increases. I don't agree to that. And I don't think so. a lot of people would agree to that. We are trying to enable that yeah. using the approach of quantum computing. This is the next in-line technology. Yeah. So that's that's my background, I would say. Well, that's a, that's a most thrilling introduction, right, from the start, right? That's rare that I find people introduced to CFD in high school, and that's <laughs> awesome. It really sounds like um, you've had some awesome experiences in your undergrad. And correct me if I'm wrong, right? One of the things we like to emphasize on the show is what skills really stand out at developing in CFD? And it looks like if I'm extracting some bits from hearing your story, you were exposed to the equations early on and doing not only like coding and, and really digging into the equations of what CFD does numerically, how it solves, but it's some experimental work, right? In a wind tunnel. Mm -hmm. And so that's always a huge helpful combination. If you can just speak to that for a little bit, I feel like with it being so easy to access a code in today's world, right? Open foam, other educational commercial licenses. If you can just speak to how the time that you spent in an experimental lab has kind of shaped the relevance and maybe the practicality and that physical aspect of intuition, you know, of how has that played a role as you've been on this path of really the Everest of, of CFD, shall we say, right? Thank you. That was a, that's a great question. And I want to emphasize that it is the mathematics. I, I cannot stress enough with people, you know, it's really just the mathematics, which is the most core of everything that we are doing. If if you are a high school student who wants to get into this field or an undergrad who want to progress further, I think so the mathematics is the most important thing. And 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 every bit of mathematics, not just calculus, but linear system, mm -hmm. you know, linear algebra, as we say, statistics and, and all that comes along. So I think so mathematics is the most fundamental skill. Mm -hmm. The number two is physics. And physics, you don't need to know like something like quantum physics until you're not doing quantum computing. But physics, the intuition of physics. Uh, yeah. What do we solve? Navy Stoke, it's it's really F is equal to MA. It's just mm -hmm. in a very expanded form. Sure. But but that's that's really the physics uh, and the mathematics. I would be very honest. I did not do coding and I was not good at coding mm. uh, until third year of my undergrad. I actually got the opportunity to spend a summer at Purdue University where I was working on developing this non-linear a spring system, which is a passive load alleviation technique for wind turbines. Mm -hmm. And it is there I was exposed to like scripting and mm -hmm. writing codes and uh, things using Abacus. Uh, I'm grateful for that opportunity. Yeah. But it was the real coding on my CFD only came when I started my uh, uh, grad school at RPI. But before that, I built such a strong fundamental first from theoretical. Mm -hmm. So any term you pick up on any equation in, in, in Navier Stoke or any other form of Navier Stoke, I could tell intuitively what it means and what yeah. it means. And that's, uh, you know, fluid mechanics 101 and aerodynamics mm -hmm. 101, as, as you read, rightly pointed out. It is those experimental experiences that I had 
and I don't consider myself an experimental person, but the intuition that I learned, you know, okay, this is actually what happens, you know, and, and again, I'm very grateful for the course at Rutgers because they did that both for subsonic as part of the course, as part of my research, I did supersonic, but that whole emphasis on you can really understand that this is my equation this is what i put and this is what i get that that was really amazing to see initially it was all clearing and also it was it was a more exciting but when yeah. i get, got into pib and when i can visualize and i can really see yes there is a phenomena that is happening especially when i first saw my lambda waves after the pib port processing it was exciting and i still remember that image because i have it saved as my wallpaper for a long time those intuition became so handy that during grad school in in u.s system we have an exam that you have to pass through and i did not have to work too much hard on my fluid mechanics course because it was just intuitively placed in my mind yeah. Other courses I had to work more harder, I would say. But but uh, I am really, uh, again, very grateful for the opportunities I've got with the professors who spend time with me, office hours, and also my mentor. Yeah. He spent a lot of time with me in his office, you know, explaining me each and everything. And I used to ask lots and lots of questions. So don't, don't hesitate. I would say people who are listening, don't hesitate to ask questions. Yeah, I think I was just talking about this on LinkedIn this week. Of th- There's... I think it's worse for engineers too, right? There's this mentality that's unintentionally created in schooling, I think, of we're embarrassed to say, I don't know, especially as engineers, right? Because maybe some of your friends are in other majors that aren't as technically rigorous. And so it creates this this facade where if you've got the question, there's likely 10 people next to you that have got the same question or more and just ask it, right? Let's get over that hurdle of this is difficult stuff. Let's acknowledge it and and everyone needs a mentor. We've all been there when we've been scratching our heads at the vector calculus and wondering, okay, I haven't quite wrapped my head around this. And that's normal, right? Let's normalize the difficulty of, of some of this stuff because different parts come easier for some people than others and it goes both ways. So awesome. Let's let's dive in a little bit more. For someone who is coming at this from like a classical computation standpoint, what are some key fundamentals to even understand? Because this is really a, a total paradigm shift from when we talk from classical computing to quantum computing. So maybe we can talk about bits and qubits and and if you can kind of just give a brief introduction for someone yeah, who really doesn't have any background at all. For sure. Uh, so on when we think about, you know, quantum computing, we always think about this uh, like a sci-fi movie sort of a thing. A lot initially in, in our, when we started our entrepreneur journey, you know, explaining people that quantum computers really existed was a tough task, but now there's a lot more awareness. I, I just want to say, right, uh, First of all, my quantum computing. We we have built chips now where things have gone to nanometer scale. Anything that you go lower, you start to go into such smaller scales that quantum phenomena start to make sense. Or as we do, you know, or sensitive sensitive analysis, you, like your phenomena start to emerge there. Hence, uh, the, the computer scientists of this world have thought about that the next in line technology has to be quantum computing. So now what are those phenomena that I'm talking about? Uh, there are in quantum physics, when we used to study as high school students, I think so, or in, during our undergrad, you would have studied that, okay, there is you know some form of particle wave nature, the Heisenberg uncertainty. It, it's, it's just those things. And we name it two. One is entanglement and the other is superposition. And these phenomena are counterintuitive to our understanding of uh, normal physics or classical physics, as we say, Newtonian physics, as we say. And, and the reason why that is either they exist in very, very, very small scale or very, very, very large scale. So you're talking about atoms and molecules or you're talking about like black holes and all. So it's only in those two ranges that these these things exist. How we think about quantum computing now is our classical world says that everything is black and white, meaning it's bits, it's zeros and ones. But we see in real life that we have shades of, you know, gray, we have other shades also. And that's what really quantum computing explains. Like you, you're not just zero, not just one, you're every possibility between zero and one. But once you measure it, once you actually touch it, any shade, it will either collapse to black or it will collapse to white, meaning it will either collapse to zero or it will either collapse to one. And that's nothing but Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that when I'm measuring, that uncertainty is lost and it has to always collapse back because measuring is a classical activity. It's a classical world activity, not a quantum 
uh, scale activity, I, I should say. So, so that's, that's what happens. Now, when I start to utilize now collapsing the two concepts together of, as I mentioned, qubits, this shades of, like mm -hmm. I said, zeros and ones or black and white, and it's anything mm -hmm. between zero and one is qubits and uh, two phenomena of entanglement over position. When I tie it together, that's what is the advent of quantum computing. So when I start to utilize the possibilities between zeros and one with the concept of superposition, which really means that the, the true superposition that we think about, which is you have one state and you have other state, once you make it, either it will go to a bigger state or it will collapse, like how we think about waves. And entanglement is, it does not matter how much distance is between two particles. If one particle rotates, the other particle will also rotate. So once you have a qubit, in a superposed state and you are in your there's entanglement so if you move or you spin one qubit the other qubit which is entangled with it is also going to spin so you utilizing those two phenomena is what creates the basics of quantum computing and the last part that i want to highlight here is you can make quantum computers or qubits i should say with different types of small scale particles so you can make it either out of photon electron you can make it out of uh, ions. You can make it out of neutral atoms. And all these, what makes different types of quantum computers possible. So, and it could be other, it could be carbon nanotube. We have seen those quantum, quantum hardware coming up. So these are some of the basics. Now, the, the biggest question is, how is that, you know, I, for coming from a classical, you can say HPC side and classical CFD side of things, jumped yeah. into this. Again, as I mentioned, everything is mathematics. Qubits at the end of the day are mathematics. It just instead of a uh, simple number, algebraic number, they're complex numbers. And so I'm, I'm just trying to see how can I utilize complex numbers in my current algorithms to make it prone to you being utilizing quantum computing and quantum, like qubits per se and use this phenomena of entanglement and superposition, which again can be explained using the mathematics, which is laid in quantum information theory. So that's, that's really the very basis of how uh, people, you know, from from classical world can think of this as just another mathematics and another formulation in mathematics. So this is probably a really crude analogy, but I always like to bring things back to simple things. So when you're talking about the scales, right, we're going from using a traditional wrench to using micrometers, right? We want to make sure we have the right tools mm -hmm. for the phenomena we're using to execute the computations, right? Is that a good way of... Yes, yes, you can say that. We currently live in the world where classical computers were maybe back in 70s and 80s. That's why we are doing all these gate level calculations. I strongly believe in the next three to five years and we are already seeing the tools you know are maturing and everything we will start to go back to that simple like python c++ coding or maybe there's quantum some quantum language where we will be doing the code to extract what we have to extract but but your an analogy is 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 right that what part of the computer are we playing with are we playing with the wrench or are we playing with those micrometers yeah. in the computing technology but as CFD algorithms, I don't think so. We have to worry about those things once the yeah. technology matures. If someone wants to get a good introduction to quantum computing, is there a text or maybe a, an online course that, that could give someone, bring them up to speed with what they would need to know? A recommendation for that? So I want people to, you know, learn quantum computing. I'm a big advocate. Yeah. There are a few things people can do. Uh, back when we started Boson QSI, Kiskit in India was doing a very good job on encouraging people to take up quantum computing and they had some very basic courses. Now, uh, I actually learned my quantum computing basics quite long back now, I would say, from Professor uh, Varzani from, I think he's from UC Berkeley. I, at that point of time, or maybe I'm saying wrong, but his course was online. You can yeah. take up. I, I also, if, if you want, I, I have a small, you can say, folder what I've made for, you know, people to just learn about quantum computing, yeah. aware, you know, what quantum computing can do for you. We are yeah. talking about the next in line technology of computing. We never thought our world would be like this, like Zooms and, you know, Google Chromes, now chat GPT, until unless we didn't think about, you know, the, the very basic technology of computing. Now with more te technology coming in with quantum, what else can we do? So every, it will change all different facets of life. And I think so understanding that 
and then going into the basics is 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 very good so i'm happy to also share with that with you yeah. if you, if you think your audience would be benefiting yeah. from that we can if you're comfortable we can drop it in a link on the on the show notes here and mm-hmm. uh, they can have access to it thank you for doing that i think um mm-hmm. As you can tell, I'm uh, still wrapping my head. I, I'm not a quantum guy. Don't come from any background of it. My background is civil engineering, very traditional fluid mechanics and classical compute. So this is this is really interesting, really eye-opening on a paradigm shift. I guess another thing I'd love to touch on, Abhishek, is you, you've started a company, right? You and your friend from undergrad, you've, you've co-founded this company. And quite early, right? It's not like... Um, you waited around to do this and to tackle this. So what, what's that experience been like, right? You've got some some rigorous technical training you've gotten, but what has the business side of things been like? I understand, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe just walk through funding and, and and what's that been like as far as building the business? I'm just loving, you know, as an entrepreneur, the journey. I never ever thought about, to be honest, that in 2023, uh, I will be an entrepreneur and not a PhD who is just, you know, towards the end of my you know, PhD, uh, PhD degree, I would say grad school studies. To be honest, um, and I will be very honest with you, if pandemic did not happen, I don't think so was on QSI existed. Okay. Let's unpack and this a little bit. Yeah. I was doing just fine. I was all in my curious grad school, you know, somebody kid in the candy store, just reading papers, you know, writing codes, struggling with, you know, 16 decimal place. I I was in that zone, to be honest. Yeah. Pandemic happened for the two, three months, the initial few months, I I took time to adjust because I was, I was racing towards a goal and uh, pandemic, you know, taught us one very simple lesson that life is so uncertain. Yes. We we kept on saying that to everybody, to ourselves and to people around. Mm -hmm. And I utilized that narrative that if life is so uncertain why do i have to wait for my phd to get over to do something you know to make my cfd software company yeah. because that's what the passion me and ruth my co-founder shared we used to live in the same dorm room and, and every night when we used to have dinner we used to just talk about discuss about how to solve navia stone yeah. so 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 i said why why do we have to wait for us to get a phd you know i i can, I'm, i still have that researcher in me i have that narrative or like the thought process of being a phd sure uh, i want to start today i'm just grateful um i'm grateful for you know my first of all my co-founders ruth mm-hmm. and josh josh is a cousin of mine you know comes from the business operation finance he has worked in startups he has okay you know help build startups and all of this so he was the first person of you know who who's crazy enough as as us to you know bring us on board i'm i'm very grateful for the, these two guys to accept my craziness and also then grateful for our family who you know believed in us and yeah. they all believed in us and they said that you know go ahead he will support you especially my uh, dad uh, he's he's very he has always been saying to me you know you you have that entrepreneur mindset you should you should bring up some idea and you should do something he has been saying that for years now i would say and then i come from a business family i have yeah no people to look up to as an engineer in my family i'm the only i think so aerospace engineer anywhere close to aerospace engineering to be honest okay but uh, that that's what happened and uh after that i will be again just the people who we have surrounded ourselves with it's the advisors the advisors you know led to other folks the the people in our company the 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 technical folks who believed in our vision, then the investors who jumped on board. I have I have received so many no's, you know, from so many people. And I don't even care about it at this point of time because I only care about those few people who even have slightest of idea of what we are doing. And they know that this is a very disruptive, it's a, it's a not even a cur- cutting edge, they like to call it, it's bleeding edge. Uh, we are changing the world here, but it doesn't come, you know, easy. Um, and the entrepreneur journey has been just amazing because we have been taught first how to take a researcher, how to take a scientist out of us and bring a businessman. Mm-hmm. And that is one simple line, Kate, I would like to share with you that it was said by our advisory board uh, chairman, Mr. Vijay Sethi. He said, you know, uh, the day you will realize this, that a business is in the business of making money, you will, you will really, you know, do the right thing. And that simply means that I can build the most awesome CFD, you know, based simulation software. But if nobody's ready to pay for it, 
I don't think so. I've done the right business. So that 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 really changed us. And from there, it has been an uphill journey. Lot of focus BQP has, and I'm very proud of it that it has been in limelight in the Indian ecosystem elsewhere. But it's overwhelming at the same time because we are still figuring out a lot of very very highly technical questions that we have to still answer for ourselves. But but I'm I'm proud of the the ecosystem that we are building around ourselves. I'm very happy to also see uh, different companies who have started to come in because it gives validation to us and it gives validation to investors, other you know technologists that. Yes, there is a field of you know physics simulations that can benefit from quantum computing, and I'm I'm very happy to see. We don't want to be alone in this space. I would say so. Seeing different companies pop up is is very exciting. Yeah. But as an entrepreneur, the 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 last two and a half years or three years has been very exciting. Even today, as the question you asked, how are we figuring out? You know the business part of things because we know our science, we know our mathematics, but how are we figuring the business part? The fundraising uh, taught us a lot. That's where I took the plunge of not being a grad student anymore. I thought that it's it's time for me to become full time CEO now. Okay. So eight months ago that happened. Okay. Uh, I came out of my PhD. I'm I got my master's. Uh, the same day I told my professor that I'm going to do this full time, he said, you can graduate tomorrow because you have enough research and you have done your courses. So yeah. it was been very grateful. Yeah. And uh, what we are now figuring out is uh, our GTM strategies, our product with the customers and how mm-hmm. we commercialize. And for that, actually, we have not yet announced it publicly, but we are part of this accelerator called as Alchemist, which we have just started, which is will be helping us. There are a bunch of other programs we've just got. News is not public. I'm utilizing your platform to talk about it. But but that's where we are in our journey to really think about GTM and the business part of things. That's awesome. Really neat story. Really cool principles there to extract and to break down. I just want to touch on a few things. One, specifically for entrepreneurship, right? It, it is so critical to to benchmark the value you're providing by if someone's willing to pay for it, right? And as engineers, that's that's not intuitive for us, right? We're mm-hmm. attracted to the more scientific, the next level thing. And it is difficult. It kind of goes against the natural grain of most engineer scientists, right? But I think that advice goes for anyone doing CFD in any industry, right? If you're expecting to make money from it, you've got to be able to tie the value back to the customer at the end of the day. And if you're not expecting to make money for it, great. We all love our hobby CFD, but I think we can get confused sometimes. And that's that's a big hurdle I see early on people missing out on is solving the wrong problem per se. I, I would like to highlight yeah. here. Is okay. Right after I finished my Purdue summer program, I was invited to Denmark for this wind energy summer school. Okay. Uh, and and I, I, I was there, like I said, I was doing this passive load alleviation of wind turbine blades, you know. Mm-hmm. And I told the the engineers I met, met at like Vestas and Siemens Gamis about this. And like, you know, this is the technology you guys will be opting for because you're just talking about this problem. And one thing that I got the feedback was we can be doing the most fanciest thing in academia. To come to that industry, you need that TRL level to be very high. You need to, as you mentioned very rightly, so you have to tie it to the business value. It's not about the science. It's about the money at the end of the day, either generating money or saving money. Is my technology doing that? If not, then like I said, you're in the wrong business per se. Yeah. And that was a game changing thing for me. So everything that I've done after that, I've always tied that, okay, is this providing some value to the industry, the application, mm-hmm. the application, application? That's that's what, what always I have focused on along with my science. I, I'm yeah. never going to leave my science, but if you if you really want to make a difference, that's that's where you have to be. Yeah. Welding the two is the most unique combination, right? And that's where the value drives home. Because it's got to be technically sound. It's it's a necessary but not sufficient thing, right? One other thing I want to touch on a little bit is with you building out the team as you were going through this, I think one of the the struggles that I I'm observing as people reach out to me and kind of ask things in the conversations that I'm having in my little circles, it's the democratization of CFD, right? We can kind of talk, that word's been thrown around a lot, but there, there are not enough mentors to to fill out all the interest that people have in CFD. That's something I'm observing, that it's really difficult for people to find the right mentors. And so one of the purposes of this podcast is to help disseminate some of the the lessons learned that you're not going to find in textbooks. And so when you looked at, at filling out your team, what were the key skills 
that you'd recommend that if somebody wants a good start to a CFD career, obviously there's going to be some quantum specific stuff with, mm -hmm. with BQP, right? But what are the key skills that you're looking for in that team as you were going through hiring um, from the, the technical development side, I guess, primarily because most people listening to this mm -hmm. are, are going to be exploring that that path probably. So. so leaving the quantum part aside, because we don't really hire quantum specialists, there are few. But even for those and the, the people who, so we have three tech teams. We have a software team, which develops the software. There is a quantum team, which develops the quantum algorithms. And the third thing that, which is the most important, which is the simulation team. In simulation team, what we look for is number one goes without saying mathematics. They need to be very strong in mathematics. If they're okay in Python, they're okay in C++, they can learn that. Yeah. I have learned that. So I'm, I'm, you know, I always encourage that people with strong mathematics. Number two is their fundamentals have to be clear. You are talking about your undergrad coming out of undergrad. If you have, you know, what a Navier-Stokes equation means, each term of it, what a Perger's equation means, just the fundamentals. If that's clear, I think so. Those are the only two things which are required. Yeah. Everything else can be learned. Everything else can be learned. You know, you might take 10 days, you might take two months. And of course, we have timelines, you know, sometimes somebody is a little bit early, it does not match. Sure, that's okay. Yeah. But at some point of time, BQP will be big enough, you know, to support. One thing in India that I've heard a lot in initial days, there's not enough opportunities for developers. Mm. And there's then not enough developers in India. There are fantastic folks coming, coming out of India in like CFD and others, but there was not enough people who can actually do development of different, not just CFD, but like we are doing design optimization, thermal mechanics, structural mechanics, and so on and so forth. And, and that kind of education, I feel like is highly provided in Europe uh, more than in US. US, of course, there is, but I think so Europe uh, universities and more so researchers, you know, get, get that kind of an opportunity to build methods, to build algorithms, to code that up but for anyone who's trying to enter this kind of a field and want to make a difference mathematics is number one number two having your fundamentals of your whatever physics you have picked up whether cfd structural thermal whatever the fundamentals have to be clear and number three some some level of coding experience would be very much appreciated if people are confused which language i would put it very simply c++ is the language to go for you learn one language you can learn all language but you once have that mindset of a coder you, you will keep that yeah. with you. It, it's the same thing as, as you're talking. I'm just reminded, like the goal of engineering school was to train you to think like an engineer, right? Nobody remembers the textbooks. Nobody remembers everything off the bat. The goal of coding is to train you to think like a mm -hmm. coder. And then yeah. the syntax is just learning the differences, right? Obviously that's that's way overgeneralized, but mm -hmm. I think that's the point we're making in this discussion, right? Overnight, I, I learned Fortran. Overnight, I learned Python. And again, I'm not anyway saying that i'm anyway smart in coding there are tremendous you know folks who are out there but simply for me it's it's just putting one thing to another as you yeah. syntax everything yeah. else. if you go for the roots you know where all the leaves are right you don't exactly. have to spend time digging through the leaves well it's been so good to, to have you on the show abhishek <laughs> i really appreciate it and uh thank you for coming on i wish you all the best with bqp so Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And you're doing an amazing job with this, telling people what people need to be thinking about. One thing I will leave people with the thought of, if you haven't uh, read uh, or the report of uh, CFD 2030 vision, go do that. If you're, if you're struggling to see where you need to go with CFD, that's the place you need to be going and doing things and making a difference there. But thank you so much, Kate, for having me. And I'm really um, genuinely, uh, thank you for, for having me here and exciting, exciting times ahead, I would say. Thank you for listening. Really, thank you. What happens next is the most important part of the episode. Pick one thing that you can do in the next day to apply what you learned. Then do that one thing. See you on the next episode.